Oh, maybe I should get a beer first. Oh, no, we're live. <laughs> <laughs> Just in time. Um, cut, cut. I got we can we can pause and start over. No, I, I mean, I'm almost you just inspired. Friday. I this will be one of our outtakes for the montage. <laughs> okay, yeah. Where's the ah, where's the beer? One, two. So if you could be really fast, I'll go get my second one, and then we'll start. Okay, sounds good. I'm going. All right, bye. One, two, three, right. Okay. Okay. Good. Now I have one to, to start on after I finish this one. To yeah. begin our podcast. <laughs> Sponsored by. Oh. Sponsored by. Yeah. What I'm drinking right now. Are you drinking Negro Modelo? Uh-huh. Mm. It's not my favorite, but I, I'm glad that you enjoy it. Okay, so um, you can introduce us. Okay. Uh -huh. Good afternoon. Uh, today we will be ha hosting our fourth episode of the non-existent story. For today's episode, Casey will be presenting her two stories and excerpts from each accompanied by a musical selection of her choice. One, as you know, will be real and one will be not yet real. And it is my job to figure out which is which. And without further ado, Casey. Thank you. So this one is inspired by last week's uh, reading by Hannah um, about a rivalry as characterized by Jonathan Swift between the ancients and the moderns. So both of these stories uh, belong to what you might consider the, the ancients. Um, they could both be categorized as ancient Greek science fiction. So we'll see how that goes. Story one, a brief prelude. Having nothing better to do, I now turn my attention to the writing of untruths, but honestly, and that the only truth I assert is that I lie, this being an excuse for all the rest, which I have neither seen nor suffered nor heard about from others. On a whim then, and for no particular reason, I outfitted a crew of 50 men and set out to locate the bounds of the West Ocean. Shortly after losing sight of land, darkness descended upon our ship, and we were caught in a tempest, which raged for 79 days. On the 80th day, the sun reappeared, and we saw on the horizon an island full of mountains and forests. The ship weighed anchor, and I took half my crew to explore the island. Midway through the forest, we came upon a river of wine, which we followed upstream to a great thicket of vines whose roots grew deep but whose tops ended in the torsos of naked women. Grapes sprang out of their fingertips, and their hair was made of grape leaves all entangled. Some of them spoke Greek, and they kissed us, and two of my men were bold enough to enter into carnal mixture with them, but afterwards could not be loosened and remained attached to the vines by the nether regions. We fled in terror and set sail. The very next day, a whirlwind captured us and lifted us aloft many thousands of miles in the air and bore us forward full sail for seven days until on the seventh night we saw a great glittering country floating in the air. We landed and were brought forthwith to the king to whom we told our misfortunes and who in turn told us of his own and how he too was born in Greece, but then abducted in his sleep and brought here to be king of this country, which those down on earth call the moon. It seemed that the moon king was now at war with the king of the sun over the rights to colonize the morning star. We pledged our fealty to the moon king and vowed to, wa and vowed to wage war on his behalf. Having no mounts, we crossed the heavens on foot atop a great shimmery web woven by spiders of mighty size. But the Moon King's army was vanquished by the mercenaries of the Sun King, men with dog faces who rode into battle atop winged acorns. My companions and I were taken captive, and the Sun King erected a great wall of clouds to block its light, thereby casting eternal darkness over the surface of the moon. But we pleaded on behalf of the moon people and brokered a treaty with the sun king and returned to the moon where the king offered me his son in marriage, there being no women amongst them. I declined with much respect, and after a week of feasting, we again set sail and continued on down through fiery star countries of glittery color until we landed once again upon the sea. 
Now, the excerpt I'm going to read occurs at the very end of the voyage, and I'm going to accompany it naturally by an instrumental cover of Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. At a lower volume. We coasted many other countries and lastly arrived at the Morning Star, now newly inhabited. From thence, we entered the zodiac, passing by the sun. Then we made fords all the next night and day, and about evening tide following, we came to a city called Lycnopolis, still holding on our course downwards. This city is seated in the air between the Pleiades and the Hyads, somewhat lower than the zodiac. And arriving there, not a man was to be seen, but rather lights in great numbers running to and fro, which were employed, some in the marketplace and some about the haven, of which, many, of which many were little and but poor things. Some again were great and mighty, exceeding glorious and resplendent. And there were places for them all. Everyone had his name, as men do, and we did hear them speak. There no harm, but invited us to feast with them. Their court of justice stands in the midst of the city where the governor sits all the night long calling everyone by name. And he that answers not is condemned to die as if he had forsaken his ranks. Their death is to be quenched. We also standing amongst them saw what was done and heard what answers the lights made for themselves and the reasons they alleged for tarrying so long. There we also knew our own light and spake unto it and questioned it of our affairs at home, and how all did there. That night we made our abode there, and on the next morrow returned to our ship. And that is the end of the first story. Oh, that was beautiful. Thank you. Pink Floyd's great. Um, story two. Again, keeping within the, the genre, the generic confines of um, ancient Greek sects science fiction. It is known that Lucibus of Alea viewed the all as a great void, full of elemental elements to which he gave the name atoms, which do fall and swirl about within the void and entangle with one another. Out of such entanglements arise great worlds, unlimited in number, and into them worlds are again dissolved. Them, taught Lucibus, is to know the essence of our being, and yet, he added, it is impossible for any mortal to perceive a single atom, so small are they in weight and in dimension. Lucibus had many pupils. The least among them was Diminus of Pigsunte. Diminus was feeble of frame and taciturn of nature. He could neither read nor write, and when he spoke, he pronounced his words like unto the barbarians of the north. There being no one with whom he could hold forth in learned discussion, while the pupils of Lucibus did debate how stars and the moon are born of atoms, Diminus remained apart and pursued alone the course of his speculations, full determined withal to isolate and see himself the most elemental of elements. I am a small man, he would have said, could he but speak. I am not worthy of speculating on the great all and the even greater void. I seek the atom, only one. Yet no matter how minute in size the object chosen, a grain of sand, an eyelash, the seed of an orchid, no blade was fine enough, no substance strong enough to break it into solitary atoms. One morning, while Lucibus was teaching, he found himself interrupted by the banging of stones and the unintelligible cries of Dimus hammering away at a speck of dust on the far side of the atrium. Lucibus reprimanded Diminus, who, Quieted and verily ashamed, paused from his labors and partook of some olives, spitting out the pits upon a white cloth. Witnessing this act of defiant spewing, for thus did Lucifer perceive it, the philosopher grew irate and betook himself towards Diminus, who, hasty to hide the proofs of his indulgence, pulled the cloth down in the middle, creating a depression into which the pits of the olives tumbled. Dimonus then saw that he had just made the surface of the center of the cloth very small. Not only small, but negatively small, and this smallness exerted force upon the olive pits, pulling them in a, into its recesses. He realized at once that he had not found the atom, he had found something even smaller still. Ecstatic, Dimonus let forth a yell, as he had been taught, of Eureka, but the cry, once issued forth from his clumsy tongue, fell upon the ears of Leosippus as another word, whose meaning, in Alea, was son of a toothless whore, whereupon Leosippus, enraged, dealt Demonus a mighty blow. 
When Demonus regained consciousness, he found himself in possession of an extraordinary power. He could now make infinitely small space out of any surface in the world, simply by tugging on it in the same manner as he had tugged the cloth. The size of the surface mattered not. He could draw any city and its peoples nearer to him, and need not, as other mortals, himself traverse the space between. And so, with but a tug, Demonus summoned towns and empires to him, and he grew mighty and powerful in his art, until one day he vanished into the pit of one of the negative spaces of his own creation. And thus did Demonus of Pinxunte abjure himself from the company of the philosophers of Alea, and he was never seen, nor suffered, nor heard about by others, and his name is unwritten in the history of the Eleatics. The excerpt, and this excerpt takes place right after Lucipus um, uh, hits Demonus quite strongly. And I'm going to continue with Pink Floyd, because I like oh, I like the theme. <laughs> it's, it's in keeping. Long did the blow of Lucipus leave Demonus lingering in the realm of the unconscious on the floor of the Eleatics. When, four hours after the setting of the sun, he did at last regain the possession of his senses, he arose and went forth into the Agora. The magistrate was passing by in her litter. One of her number dropped a ribbon of silk, which flew across the way. Demonus grabbed it and pulled, it, pulled at it as he, had, as he had the cloth of olive pits. Immediately the wife and her litter did suddenly find themselves thrown atop Demonus, with great protest and dismay on both sides. Diminus was much astounded at his powers. Leaving off thereafter, the purpose of making disappear that separated his person from that of others, he took instead to abolishing spaces that separated towns from towns and cities from cities. In the second year of the possession of his powers, he diminished the space between Alea and the great eastern capital of Byzantium. But no sooner had he achieved this feat than in a great cry resound among the people, for the queen of the Byzantines had just then been crossing through the city gates, followed by her retinue and a horde of golden monkeys. And then all at once she was no more, she had vanished like fog in the sun, together with her retinue and all but one of the monkeys. Demonus, finding himself alone at the gates of Byzantium, with only a straggling yellow monkey atop his shoulder, at once understood. The Queen of Byzantium had suffered the fate of the Olive Pits. She had, by some means, fallen into the abyss of the infinitely small space that lay below the surface of the void and the all. I read not, but did at once follow the Queen down into the diminishment. Sweet zephyrs buoyed him as he plunged ever downwards, so that he fell as a leaf falls from a tree. The Queen's monkeys still swirled like rain around him, transforming so that some grew long beards and took on the limbs or the faces of men while others expanded into gorillas or sprouted wings and scales. And then, weaving round him a circle of arms and legs and tails, chatter at him until their chattering took on the form of singing, the song of the monkey, long and high, the song of the primitive beyond the void. The end of the excerpt. Obviously, the story continues. Okay. Yes. Well, so <laughs> tell me your well, thoughts. Well, I was I, first of all, I, I had no idea that this genre existed. So I'm I'm delighted to discover that there is ancient Greek science fiction, and I wish there was more of it because it's very good. Um. So uh, no, both were both were really uh, beautifully described and written, and I think Pink Floyd is definitely appropriate because there were psychedelic elements to both, very much so. So definitely. So so in the first one that you presented, uh, I guess I have I have some speculation and maybe some questions, and then the same for the second one. So in the first one is interesting because um, the the way in which the story is presented, it's in the first person, and the narrator is very much to the front, and he says that I lie. So it kind of sets how you hear the rest of the story, and also how you interpret the the excerpt that is written, and it has these really awesome images, like the uh, the rivers of wine, and then the naked women with the hair, and and the men that copulate with them and then are connected to them by by their nether regions, which is actually I don't know that's really cool image for some reason. Um, 
and then the moon king and the, the winged acorns is probably my favorite that was really good um and then the the part where it says that the people of the light and then after they gone through that city he made the comment now we we know we we came to know our own lights so i think that was the the big parallel that i took um from from the first story into the second story because it seems that both appropriately i suppose being of ancient greek origin are concerned with the pursuit of knowledge the quest of knowledge that's interesting you know there um there's a a longer version of the excerpt of the second story that that i ended up cutting down quite a bit um in which Dimonus, when he falls um into into this negative space that he has magically created and then he sort of um topples into he encounters himself so there's also this um, this self like this this long journey which brings you back to kind of a, a vision of the double, really. And yeah, so that's interesting that you you hit on that as a parallel because it was a parallel. It was a more explicit parallel originally, and then I took it out. But uh, the, the, it's funny that I think it both works kind of kind of nicely because our own our own lights in the sense of uh, of illumination. Mm -hmm. No, so that was, I think, uh, very, very cleverly. I, I can see the themes between the two outside of the similarities in genre, um, the subject matter. Um, and then, so the first one also had so many fantastic, I mean, they were both fantastical, of course, but, but like how they, they captured that in different ways. So in the first one, you had all of these incredible images um, of movement and you're you're picturing or at least i was this vast space of of sky and and, and stars and, and and webs that intertwine all of these interplanetary motions and and it's so it's it's definitely again goes back to the pink floyd really psychedelic sense of movement where you're kind of disoriented and then again that's also captured but in a somewhat different way in the second story when when in the excerpt he dives into this non-existent space and i really like the phrase the abyss of the infinitely small space i thought that was brilliant um, um and then there's there was more i think the second one also made more effort or i i, I thought that it made more effort to to capture the the historical references to ancient greece um not just with the names of course but the olives and the cloth because i mean greek olives and then the, the exclamation of Eureka, um, the reference to the Iliads, it was all, I mean, there were others too, those ones stuck out, but um, I don't know. What the do you think as far as? The Eleatics, which is a, a school of a philosophy that I can't tell you a lot about, but I know that it exists and I've always thought it was a, a beautiful term to be Eleatic. Ah, oh, that is very lovely. No, so it was, they were just both extremely beautiful. Um, and if they're not, both real published stories i think they should be um uh -huh. but i i was really captured by the quest of knowledge within both but i would be interested in seeing what how how you found that they they differed because it wasn't exactly the same so in one in in the first one it was almost like a group of, of pirates or explorers and it was they were just out you know they were copulating with women trees and and, and fighting wars for people. And then the other one, it seemed like in your more pure trying to, to understand the atom and, and how, how everything is, it, it was knowledge for knowledge's sake versus kind of just exploring for the, the glory of it. I don't know if that stuck out to you or not or what your impression of yeah, that. Yeah, no, I think that, that one is definitely begins, you know, for, on a whim and for no particular reason there's just this kind of like loose reference to uh let's find out how far this goes but it it is much more uh cavalier whereas uh, and, and it's a group everything is always a group of of people so it's even though there's a first person narrator it's always him and his crew or him and his companions and then there are different battles that are engaged with engaged in with with different peoples who are who are quarreling with one another, but uh, singular characters are are hard to come by. Whereas in the second one, the the overwhelming 
emphasis is on uh, singularity and, and exceptionality. So you have this one particular uh, student of philosophy who has certain traits that make him unlike the rest of the, the philosophy students. And he has something of a, of a personality, even though it's, it's kind of glossed over because of, you know, the nature of, um, of our task, which is, you know, sort of the, the narrative summary. Uh, and then his his quest to to isolate and isolate and purify and purify until you get something that could be called um, not necessarily radically singular because it's supposed to be like the the stuff of which the universe is made, but something that is that is that is solitary and and very very small. So on the one hand, there's this there's a tendency towards expansion, and then there's this on the other hand, there's this tendency towards um, contraction. But what the contraction tends to do is it sets itself apart from like all this like it's not the understand the universe or understand the all and the nothing um but in doing so it finds something beyond that so it still ends up coming and having to deal with it but just in a much more abstract way because you know we're in we're in we're in a philosophical school they're not going anywhere they don't know how to do anything useful they just talk and he can't even talk so it's it's all it's all um a journey of speculation as opposed yeah, but, to, uh, but then he breaks from that with his discovery and he starts, you know, creating all of this havoc with his newfound power, um, destroying or disappearing this queen and all of her golden monkeys. And then I really, I just really love the excerpt of how he's falling and the, the, the morphosis of the, of the animals. And it, it didn't get to the queen. I don't know if he ever finds her, but um, that was very intriguing. I really like that. Yeah, I know there there's a there are many ways that it, it could go based on on that because uh what the what the summary leaves out is um all the things that, that would have happened and what this what this non space space that he's created would it would what it what its rules would be, if it would be an Alice in Wonderland sort of thing or if it would be a mirrored inversion of what goes on in, in the real world because it uh doesn't entirely exist. It's a it's a parallel universe, basically. Yeah. So so you can create your your own rules based on whatever philosophy or opposing rules of philosophy that you wanted to play with, which makes the the sci fi aspect of it, I think, so fun and kind of freeing. And, and the sci fi aspect, I found in both cases the sci fi aspect to be challenging because you. We were, uh, our internet just occasionally this will happen uh, where it just, it, it disconnects and it won't reconnect. And it's because it has, the computer is connected to like a Wi Fi amplifier, which is out in the hallway. And this amplifier, according to Cody, who knows about these things, um, it makes this all possible. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd just be writing. <laughs> but, uh, he it just it goes out sometimes and he said it's not a very good one so he needs to get a new one but in the meantime it for whatever reason it just said that there was no such thing as the internet and that we were in ancient greece and <laughs> like uh, you're a crazy person stop yes yeah, so you are mad wait what you just want to magically talk to other people at another point in space and time that is not possible yeah that sounds about that sounds like something would happen to me and i believe has but um, let me try to remember the last question I asked you so we can get back into our group. Um, we were we were talking a little bit about similarities uh, with the two stories and then the trippiness. And you mentioned certain details, which I thought was a, a really uh, insightful kind of comment. And then we talked about like the kind of the general sort of adventure buccaneer type feel that you said you got from the first one versus the... The, yeah, the, it was they. They were they were both seemed to be quests for knowledge, and um, although one as and you said one the first was perhaps more cavalier, and the second one was more, you know, an, an individual's quest. But um, I don't know, and, and, and they they both seemed to end up in places where it was it was more a search for for knowledge of self than than learning about the external world. But it, it kind of. It, 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 they both got there in different ways. I was asking you about that. Interesting. Okay, so I think one one of the things that's characteristic, and, and I'm not a classicist. I, I don't know a lot about uh, ancient Greek or ancient Latin, ancient Roman uh, literature. That, that is not my my specialty. Um, 
but one of the the senses that one gets when you read narratives is that uh they're 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 on the surface right so you you tend to be like he did this and then he did that and you have the birth of the epic and the story of a people and things like that but any term any any kind of like individual subjectivity or like a stream of consciousness or any kind of psychological then he thought like is not and in fact like the the range of affect like the amount of, like usually they're either uh they either feel lust or terror those seems to be like the two feelings that you can have <laughs> Which is still, I mean, like, kind of a primitive thing in some ways. It almost sounds like lust or terror, but, like, it's very Freudian in a way, too. <laughs> but also quite strong feelings that, that we have all been subjected to, I'm sure. So, But, like, other kind of, like, this sense of, like, a rich psychological subjectivity is, is like, a much more recent phenomenon in history. Mm -hmm. So you just kind of get this surface thing. And so when you want to talk about a bit, an individual person, like, even someone, like, and not that I'm comparing any of these with it, but even some someone like uh, Odysseus is, we know that he's tricky, we know that he lies, and we know that he wants to go home. But we, he still lacks that kind of like complicated subjectivity that like Anna Karenina or someone would have, right? Like Anna Karenina is a much more complicated person than Ulysses, even though Ulysses is obviously a more important person for literature. And it's because like in ancient literature is, is that was one of the weird things actually with writing a summary is that it is a summary. <laughs> then they did this and then they did that. And mm -hmm. you're like, well, what kind of boat was it? Like, was it made of oak? Was it, <laughs> do you have cars? Right. And, like, right. and you, you pick that up too on things like, um, crap, not Oedipus. Um, Although that might be there. Uh, what, what is it with um, Grendel? That's the only character I remember. Beowulf? Yes, Beowulf is like that too. Um, there's more import, and I, there's more import invested in certain details like how the armor like glistened and the different gems that were on it than there are the actual people. Um, but for sure, for sure, and they're like well, these they're, stories were they weren't rep, they weren't told in written form. It was it was all someone memorized all this shit, and then everybody's getting drunk at a big hall and eating like a boar. And this guy was walking back and forth, orating and sitting by a fire, and people were like throwing things at him, and he was telling you this story. So you you I don't know, and and you have to wonder how much the the invention of the field of psychology has to do with the the presence of, of of more psychologically complex and interesting characters and you get insights in how people think and then you feel more connected to the story because it's it's more of a connection with you and how you think but you don't get that you get a summary from like the older tales and did people even think it like did it change how people thought did people even think of themselves in a more isolated way or was it more communal and it can get very complex I always wonder that too, because you know, like the the one of the classic uh, notions is that uh, you have mod like late Renaissance, early modern thinkers like Rousseau with the notion of an autobiography, and then someone who has these complicated um, internal conflicts and things like that, and then that didn't exist before. But I'm like. Well, I mean, did, did like a medieval peasant like have a sense of self? Like he certainly must have. But then if he couldn't express it, did it really exist? So there, there's all these kinds of things. But like it's just like with the with the with the Greek things that have survived and Roman things less so. Romans for some reason always seem closer to us because I, I think I find them in some ways so American. <laughs> They're like <laughs> conquest they're and, also, and also drunkenness that makes them so relatable. Yes, yeah, exactly. And I will celebrate my name day with 180 uh, days of consecutive spectacle, and I will call it a roller derby or whatever. <laughs> but yeah. uh, no, but they, they tend to be lists. So you do like, and these are things that that I could have gone to into in more detail with both stories, let's say. But uh, the the descriptions of all the soldiers. So if, whenever there's a battle, you have different groups of soldiers, and what like you were saying, what they're wearing. So you have these lists, and so there's this. Yeah, and you see that in the Bible, even. Not that I want to get religious here, but the the whole the list yeah. of um, the families that go down in the Old Testament begot blank, begot blank, begot blank, like fifty names later, 
as if that somehow is interesting, which it is not. But I mean, I, I, these things used to be very important, and so. Well, I get the sense too that you know perhaps the the written word was a uh, was less readily available and more privileged and and closer to something sacred for for many years. And so, if you were recording something, it was because it was worthy of being recording, and that it gave so you a sense of eternity. More like a governmental record of the things that we bother to make official documents now. So it's all about legality and officialness and yeah. yes. and law and property. Although even Aristotle said that, you know, he's the one who who had this idea that, uh, you know, that the purpose of a, of a story is to both entertain and delight. So there's there's an educative or, you know, historical factor. And then there's always like the, the sense of pleasure that one gets from a story. So I know one could go on indefinitely with that. It's, it's very once you start comparing like uh, ancient versus modern sensibilities, it, it becomes it becomes and it's so unknowable, you know, like what we have is, is so fragmentary. Yeah, oh, you really you really do have to um, extrapolate based on things that you can get your hands on, which are kind of limited. Definitely. Yes, extremely. Yeah. Makes you wonder what would what would it have been like if ancient Rome had reality television? Oh my, it would have been great. It would have been awesome. <laughs> would it just really be like all gladiators all the time? Or I imagine it's it like been exactly the same. With like <laughs> I mean watch we my chariots. I got five. Like these these be my concubines. <laughs> my I know, right? It would be MTV, NASCAR, and American gladiators, like <laughs> for example. Yeah, except more violent because they're killing everything. They're, they're yes. that is that is a big thing. Is a human human life is is like yeah. The main character would change constantly because they would keep dying off like every two episodes. Be like Game, Game of Thrones. Another reason it's such a great show. Oh, we have to talk about this at some point. I'm watch. I'm on season three right now. Mm -hmm. But but, but I, I do I I I egress egress. I go off in tangents, and I have to. So I, I have to figure out which one of these you actually wrote. Yes, you do. Um, and then once you do that, I can talk to you about the. Back yes, which which is good. So I will. I have to decide, and this is actually the most difficult one so far. Not only it, this is harder than last time, because last time it was pretty short, and now I honestly don't know. Um, but you do, I think, though. No, I really don't. <laughs> I don't. If I if I had to guess, which I do, I would say that you wrote the second one, just because of what we discussed about the aspects of group versus focusing on an individual. But as far as style, and and with this genre, I really couldn't tell for sure. But I'm gonna guess you wrote the second one. I did write the second one. Okay. Good. All right. Good. I feel that. <laughs> well, I think actually what, and, and this is, I found your comment so helpful for thinking about, because, you know, part of this does have to do with, with trying to make one's writing as good as, I mean, there's a counter, it's a counterfeiting idea, right? The idea is to counterfeit. So I give well, you think a, of it as a springboard, though. Yes, a springboard. But I, and counterfeiting, I, I love counterfeiting. I find it a fascinating idea. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to write something that's as good as a classic. Mm. Uh, and and that's like a, a challenge. So if there's an even a moment of doubt, then it's kind of an accomplishment. But one of the things that you said, which I thought meant was kind of a sign of like acknowledging the distinction between one's own writing and someone who's actually kind of, you know, really good is uh, the you contrasted the images. So you talked about the winged acorns and uh, a couple a couple others. Um, Versus like these more conventional Greek images like olives and Eureka or something like that. I think that's the giveaway because that would be what I would I like. I, I have a more conventional notion of, of Greece, whereas a, a classic I uh, can give you these extraordinary images that I couldn't leave out because they were just too good. I, I took out a bunch. I took out a lot of stuff. But uh, yes, you're right. So the first one is um, by Lucian of Samosata and it's called A True History. And it was written in the year like one something uh, in Greek. Uh, he was, uh, he, his native language was Aramaic, like Jesus is actually. <laughs> he's, not, he's not terribly, he's not terribly false, but then again, he's, he's in the, the, the Roman era, but he's, he's a, a Greek thinker and a Greek writer. And he, he mastered Greek as a second language uh, almost perfectly. And he's a major influence. Um, he's a satirist. 
and the the true history was originally meant to be a parody of these ridiculous things so he he takes he knows homer really well and then he references other like outlandish travel tales and then with these these images that he has that are so extraordinary what he's actually trying to do is parody and be like yes yeah, so and then this happened and then i made out with a grape woman and uh, then we went flying and stuff but it doesn't work as a parody because the images that it comes up with are so cool. They're so I'm incredible. So yeah, you're like, whoa. No, they're they're beautiful. They're beautiful. And I mean, I love. There's a whole bunch of he talks all about the moon people and how they how they recreate and all these different kinds of customs and uh, and it's incredibly detailed and, and imaginative and it's it's considered one of the first purely fanciful works and it's also considered the first work of science fiction that ever existed. That's incredible. I'm so glad that you chose that one. That That's brilliant. It's cool. You know, actually how I found it, it's funny. So Cody plays this game called Civilization. And in Civilization, you it's a very complicated video game in which you get these basic elements and then you build a, a country and then it goes to war with other countries. And you win or lose based on like all these different things. So you can have resources and inventions but then you can also have great thinkers and I, at one point i was watching and it's kind of it has this beautiful music in the background and it's cool and at one point um you he won the great thinker called lucian of samosata and i'm like who is that he's a great thinker on a video game and i have no idea who he is and so i looked him up and he was most famous for this so i bought this which is here it is i mean it's in backwards it's really as you can see tiny Mm -hmm. it's super short um i bought this on on amazon uh a few months ago and i it was it's trippy it just has the most extraordinary images yeah and i totally see why you enjoyed he has this one moment like so the one i saw this is uh the true history um as translated by um francis hicks is actually his name but with an e before the s and so he's just this like yeah, this is a 1600s translation, like 1650 or 60 or something. Um, and it's just this guy who was devoted to husbandry in the translation of Greek. So that's what he did. He grant, he translated Greek and he gardened. And so it sounds like a pretty good life. But it ended up being really influential later, especially for uh, Quevedo and Cervantes, a lot of like the the great like parodists you know people who write parodies and uh and swift was definitely one of the ones who was influenced by him which i found out later so it kind of it was one of those things where it kind it of seemed to, it just seemed to be meant to be that you chose that story yeah because yeah. it's one of these things where it's like it's it's hugely intellectual but no one knows about it or at least i i had no idea i'm sure no i've never heard about it either i i don't know in my knowledge, English literature, really, or, or Western literature. So as far as Greek and Roman influences, anything anything Latin or past, I suppose, 1400, the year, I, I don't, I, I mean, not that I'm an expert on any of those periods by far, but I haven't even heard of anything beyond that point. So it's cool to get that kind of exposure. Well, just to give you some ideas, so my main reference point for all things classic, and I took Latin in high school, but aside from that, my main reference point is Gladiator starring Russell Crowe. Mm -hmm. And as we know, uh, Commodus, who's the deranged emperor's uh, father, was Marcus Aurelius. Mm -hmm. Marcus Aurelius has these meditations that he wrote. I think he was also the classic. father in um, Underworld of the Vampire and the Werewolf. That very well might be. He's also was, Dumbledore. Uh, yeah, that was him. Uh, <laughs> so Dumbledore, also known as Marcus, <laughs> uh, really liked this book, actually. So that they're like a contemporary. <laughs> there you go. I just need I just need a source to like use my way in, you know. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's weird because you do read it, and I was like, I, I only want to summarize was book one, because after this, they land on the sea, and then they're immediately swallowed by a giant whale, and they meet this guy and his son, and then they set fire to So they find all these lands, but he was influential also for uh, Rabelais, who wrote Gargantua and Pantagruel. You might know about that one. Mm -mm. Mm. Well, it's it, that's a, it's a kind of major reference point for, like, just around in Europe, just around the moment when they're discovering the new world, mm -hmm. uh, there's this whole like kind of this playful body expansion. Right? That's that's a that's a tale for another time. But uh, but yeah, so it was interesting to to try to imitate the style 
as much as I could. Uh, so lots of like did and you beginning sentences with gerunds, like being that and following therefore, in, in, but without throwing in too many extra words because it also had to be um, streamlined enough to not bore you to death. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought I, I think that you you did a really excellent job because I, after you read the first one, I was like, okay, that was pretty exceptional. That was really exceptional. So I don't know. And then you start reading the second one, I was like, oh god, these are both really good. I don't know, and I don't know anything about Greeks, and I don't know. I know, I good. nor do I. So that's that's why it works. Well, that did not come across. <laughs> No, I just I just named a couple of things because I was I had the I always have all of my ideas for anything creative. It, it's always like on a train or a plane or like that. Like I always have to be in motion to think about these things. Like I very seldom am just like just sitting there. Like I have to be going somewhere and then it works. So the the idea for the the second one uh, about Dimunos and like the creation of like these little spaces. Uh, came like I, I went to a wedding last week so i was on the plane and i was like oh i could kind of do this and then i so i always write it out by hand and then it kind of like expands yeah. but i did a fair amount of editing because it, it took a while to make it sound kind of classical and then read okay and then not be too long uh but yeah i, I love how you and when you did um uh Lu lucipus Lucipus? Lucipus is a real guy. It was the, yeah. Well, his, his existence have, has been debated, but he is considered the father of, of atomic theory. Uh -huh. So when you had, he struck Demonus and, and he he did not recover for some time and then he did and then he did something else. I, that was very good. <laughs> that sounds like something you'd read in like ancient Greek. Like, yeah, he, he sliced off his hand and then barely they went to tea and it's... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this bizarre combination of things that you do in civil society and then the unspeakably barbaric and they're interwoven. That's so. kind of the interesting thing about this particular period because you have like these guys who are debating these con these complex abstractions that no one has ever thought of before, like the nature of the universe and the theory of the atom. They have no science. It's all pure speculation. But then they go and just like, yeah, just like gouge each other's eyes out and shit too. But yeah, or was it was it Aristotle is known as being the one who he's giving these almost unintelligibly brilliant orations in the street, but he's wearing a barrel because he's decided clothes are lame with like straps. Oh, that might be Diogenes. Diogenes lived in a barrel. He was yeah. like the wandering philosopher. So, so they're saying these brilliant things, but then you're you're given some historical context, and you realize they look like total crazy people surrounded by filth and and <laughs> and this. But they also had people just like throwing rocks at them all the time, and it's it's this just this most incomprehensible kind of lifestyle for me to think about. It's quite bohemian, actually, when you when you put it that way. I, I think that this notion of the philosopher king that you learn about in like philosophy one hundred and one, where you have Plato and the Republic, and this idea that the thinkers would run the city, and that was a fantasy for them too. I'm sure. Like, I don't think that I'm sure that was just corruption and money and having to do with slaves and and things like that. One of the really interesting things too with with Lucian. Uh, he makes fun of Plato. He makes fun of everyone. He 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 likes it's it's as I, and it really is quite satirical and it is funny at moments, uh, but he the 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 normalcy with which men have sex with each other is 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 striking even to like a contemporary reader. I think like like the Moon people are just men and they just copulate with each other, but they use like the back of their knees. But it's all about like the and then there's like he, at one point the narrator is like told that he will he will live to a ripe old age provided that he doesn't like mess with any boys over the age of eighteen. So uh, like the the just the the Greek the normalcy of Greek homoeroticism is is quite striking. Um, I mean, we everyone who who knows about Greeks knows this, but just it, the way it's just kind of like kind of like in this like dependent clause is really interesting. Um, and then there, there are a lot of great moments. There was something else I wanted to tell you about about Lucian. Um, 
but uh yeah he, he's he's super he's actually kind of a big deal i found out later like just from his wikipedia page so he has a story he has a lot of uh a lot of really 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 good parodies and one of the things that it was interesting because you know you're talking about the asians and the moderns and just to read the first sentence of the introduction it is a common place of criticism that lucian was the first of the moderns but in truth he is near to our time because of all the ancients, he is the nearest to his own. So I thought this sentence really sums up quite nicely the, the interdependence of the tensions. Like because he talks about everyday life in the ancient world, so he's the most bound to like the real issues and like literature and, and discussions of the ancient world, because he's so bound to the everyday as opposed to these abstract gods, that's what makes him modern because modern literature is about everyday life as opposed to these abstractions so mm -hmm. his ancientness makes him in modern in a way anyway, oh, that's yeah. very that's very cool and and very poetic and lovely and i think is a good you know end point for both stories because they were both very poetic and lovely oh yeah. well thank you the light thing I, I really do like though I, he has other funnier like more outlandish ones but I just thought the idea of of a, a world that is populated by lights who talk to each other and they must talk to each other all the time and then they are, exist to the extent that they can justify their actions <laughs> at any place and time. So they also like tyrannize. Like it was all just very, uh, it was this great kind of, oh, it's also, this is considered like the, the main reference point for Gulliver's Travels. Really? Yes. I had no idea. Yeah. I didn't either until like I, I yeah, it was just a happy kind of coincidence. It was like, oh yeah, because he goes on he find he keeps going and he just finds these Yeah, his he's going on all of these different adventures, but with a group, which makes it more ancient because it's right. all it's it's what collective thought. Yeah. Now um we think. Oh really? Group think. Group think. Yeah, there's there's a bit of that. There's no, like, the narrator has no personality, at least not yet. I haven't finished the entire thing, but he has no personality. Like, he can be anyone. Mm -hmm. He's just sort of a, a you know, a mouthpiece or whatever. Whereas Gulliver's Travel is, is Gulliver. So it's a more. Yeah. But, yeah. So it is your turn next time. You've won every time so far. So right now, let's see. I've, I'm one and one, and you are two and oh. I am. I am. This is true. But but now I'm starting to feel like my time is coming to <laughs> like the, the, the pressure of, of getting it right each time is building. I feel like I might topple. It's, it's a, a lot of it's a lot of it's a lot of time. It, it's a, it's time intensive. But uh, I think the, the big thing for me is uh, trying to find something really weird or interesting and then seeing how good of a mimesis I can do with it. So I think you'll be fine. I'm really looking forward to what you come up with next time. Which I need to come up with when now? Wednesday or Thursday? Uh, do you want Thursday or Friday? Do you? Let me look at my calendar. Okay. My, my I'm going gonna, gonna, to uh, detener la transmisión ahora, and we'll just talk. <laughs>